troll from Troll Town says, either make a video of you making a bow or make a video of your children sticking their heads in the extreme edges of the picture waving. Don't mix the two. <laughs> All right. Troll Town. <laughs> uh, I don't know. What are you going to say? <laughs> My daughter has been in the videos as the shop elf since we started making videos and she'll continue to be in the videos as a shop elf. Uh, if you don't like it, you don't have to watch. Uh, it's funny that they would, they would mention that specifically because it's such a small part of the videos. It's just like it's supposed to be an Easter egg that's kind of fun. And it's a way for me to connect with the viewers and show a little bit about my life. And you guys get to see Corinne, the shop elf, grow up over the years. Um, she's been in some videos and she's been, you know, kind of hiding in this, in the shop for most of the videos. So it's kind of a fun thing that we add in there. So if you don't like it, that's fine. It usually only lasts for all of, you know, maybe three seconds in a video. So it shouldn't, shouldn't bother you much, but I think it's, I think, uh, each person, each content creator has their own prerogative decide to decide how much of their life they want to show the rest of the world. And there are things that I don't show the rest of the world, but you know, when I can incorporate and I can include my family into videos, I'll do it because it's uh, it's a way for us to create something that connects to the people that we're making these videos for. That it's not just purely about what I'm making, but it's about me as a person and my life and my daughter and my wife and my dogs and my family are all in there. So they make their way to the video sometimes. Hey guys, welcome back to the Art of Craftsmanship. My name is Dustin and today in the shop I'm going to be answering the five best questions of the week. Now, Devin's going to be asking me some questions from some of our viewers and from different videos, um, and I'll do my best to answer them for you guys. And at the end, I'll do a little show and tell. Let's get started. From the Osage Bow video, Michael Coffee says, I thought the sapwood was kept for its tension strength. You removed all of it. So, Michael Coffee is thinking about a traditional type of bow wood called U. You, when you're using you, um, use characteristics for tension and compression are different depending on the type of the wood. So with an Osage bow, piece of Osage, it comes with, it comes, when, you, when you split it out, it has uh, heartwood and sapwood. So the heartwood is the darker reddish wood. The sapwood is the white wood. With Osage, we remove the sapwood because that one does not have the characteristics we want. Um, the sapwood is only, it, it doesn't, it's not good for tension or compression. So I remove that because with Osage specifically, the heartwood is good for both tension and compression. Tension is when you are drawing a bow, the part that's facing away from you is stretching, that's tension, it's bending and stretching. Compression is the part that's facing towards you, it's bending and it's, it's, it's crushing together, it's compressing. The species of you wood, the heartwood is good for compression and the sapwood is good for tension. Both of those woods together make the strength of a U-bow. Those English war bows and long bows, those are all made out of U. So with U specifically, you want sapwood and heartwood, but with Osage, you only want to use the heartwood. From the Making a Bushcraft X video, Ernesto B says, it's better if you also heat treat the ax after all the grinding. The edge might have been messed up. Uh, Ernesto is referencing in the Bushcraft Axe video when I am cutting away material from the axe to create the Bushcraft uh, shape that I like. So um, I remove the nail puller and I reshaped the bit to have some more curve to it. When I was doing that, I was being really careful to not overheat the blade. As a knife maker, uh, that is a big part of grinding uh, bevels on knives after you do your heat treat because you kind of shape a blade you can do some pre-grinding but then you have to do your heat treat bef you know and then after you do heat treat then you re-grind the blade and you finish up the bevels and all that stuff so keeping the temper when you overheat steel you can lose its temper so if you heat it past the the, the temperature that you you tempered it in it can get soft or it, you can lose lose its characteristics that you want to hold the edge so when he's talking about that specifically for this axe he's saying that i need to make sure that i'm um, not overheating it that i might need to heat treat it afterward uh, i can just say that i was being really careful with these and if you are going to do something like this or modify an axe head make sure you're really careful to keep the temperature down i kept a wet rag nearby and i kept 
keeping it wet to make sure it stayed below that uh, that tempering temperature. Um, I've done ones before where I've drawn out the hammer into a spike to make um, like a hatchet uh, picaroon type thing together and for that because I was doing so much heat heating and drawing out I did re, re uh, heat treat and retemper the entire axe head but when I'm just doing modifications to an axe head I'm usually doing doing it and I'm being really careful about that heat so I'm not messing up the temper. From the bushcraft knife video Willie Deitko says do you sell your project knife? Mm. I get this question a lot. Do I sell the knives that I make? Uh, this um, this one's specifically about the bushcraft knife, and he was asking if I sell those project knives. I I typically do not sell the project knives I'm making. One of the reasons is because a lot of the times those knives are being made for a specific purpose. I might be making it for someone or for myself. Um, usually there's a purpose for it, or, or I'm giving it as a gift. Um, so those uh, knives I do not sell. Typically, um, I have sold some of my project knives before in the past, but usually I do not. And um, that kind of goes along with the second question. I get a lot of people who ask me if I sell my knives. And the question is, no, not right now. Um, I have a full-time job as a teacher. I'm a full-time husband and father. I have a part-time you know, side hustle of making YouTube videos uh, you know, at least a few times a month and getting together with Devin and making videos. Uh, and then I'm in school and with all of that and all the other hobbies I like to do because I'm not just a knife maker, I just don't really have time to make more knives to sell. Um, that's not saying that I never will. Maybe I will more in the future. I'd love to do more knives to sell, but uh, as for now, I do not. And the ones that I make in the YouTube videos, again, usually are specifically for a purpose. Now, if I were going to make knives to sell and I wanted to show them somewhere to the audience, they would be on Instagram. I like to post stuff there. And when I do have some things to sell, I, I've posted things on Instagram and I tell you that they're for sale. So if you're interested, head over to Instagram. You can follow me at The Art of Craftsmanship. From the Making an American Flatbow Hickory video, Tack Foley says, how did the Native Americans work wood like this without the use of a draw knife? They would have used other tools. So before, so before a draw knife, I'm, I'm assuming that he's asking... Uh, before a steel draw knife, right? So steel tools. Before the Native, Amer Native Americans that would have had steel tools, they would have had stone tools. So, you know, doing flint napping or, you know, any type of stone napping, you can, you break off shards the same way you get shards in glass. And those shards have really sharp edges and they are just as sharp uh, as, a, you know, a, a newly sharpened knife. So they would have known the technique to be able to break off shards of, of stone, you know, say obsidian or flint to be able to make a really sharp knife and they would have been scraping and cutting and cutting down. I mean, there's also, they also use fire to burn. So, you know, cutting down a tree, they might use some stone tools, they might use fire. If you're splitting it out, you can split it out with hammers and, and, uh, and wedges the same way you can do with steel. So they would have been able to split out and dry um, probably a lot of splitting, so kind of getting getting a wood, a piece of wood, and hitting the growth rings and splitting it out. So, um, but really using um, the tools they would have used before steel would have been stone. From the bushcraft sheath video, Dan Yeomans says, "Where's the best place to get components? Leather, tools, dye, etc." When I need some specific uh, specific tool or something like that, I'll I go buy it online occasionally, but. I really like to see the leather that I get before I order it. There's a lot of great places online, but I like to go to Tandy Leather Factory because I actually have one here in Baltimore. So I go to the actual Tandy Leather Factory store. I can see the leather. I can feel it. I can get the good deals from the store. Um, and then I can also choose through a wide variety of colors if I'm looking for something to dye. Being able to see all the colors there instead of flipping through a website and seeing how they work um, you know, on samples of leather because those are also in the store. So I really like going to Tandy Leather Factory and being able to go in and see the leather and touch the stuff and use it. Are there other chain leather like craft leather stores? stores you know? Not that I know of. I mean, I know there's Weaver, which is online. There's probably stores as well. Um, Wicket and Craig, I think that's what it's called. They do good leather. There's a lot of places you can buy leather from. I've gotten... Um, some scrap leather and things from, and leather tools and materials from like Joanne Fabrics or Michael's, you know, craft stores. You can find there too, but um, the one that's local to us here in Maryland is Tandy, so that's where I go. All right, show and tell time. This 
is a hammerhead. It's a two pound head. Uh, it says Japan stamped on it. And then it has a mark in a diamond shape that looks like it either says TJO or JJC. Um, I don't know who this is from, but when I got it, it was welded onto this metal rod. So welded on completely. Uh, I really liked the head when I saw it and it had a cool mark on it and it was two pounds, which is a good lightweight uh, poundage for a blacksmithing hammer. Um, and it said Japan on it, which I think is cool too, because I haven't seen a lot of Japanese made kind of American style heads. Uh, so I bought it for I don't know, maybe 10 bucks, maybe less. I can't remember exactly. Brought it home. I ground off the weld as much as I could. I put it in my vise and used a drift and hammered it maybe about 10 or 12 times and it popped right out. And then I cleaned up the bottom and reground it and cleaned it all off and polished the faces. And I'm going to hang this on a, uh, on a new custom handle. Do you think that was that handle original or do you think it had no. a wooden, uh, wooden handle? Yeah, no, it would, it would have absolutely had a wooden handle originally. Um, why would it, why would someone put it on a metal pole? You think, I guess just to, just for convenience, you know, you're not going to break this, <laughs> um, depending right. on what they were using it for, right. you know, maybe the person was using it for, I don't know, like smashing something repeatedly that, it didn't matter that it was on a wooden handle or not, you know, with, so the reason why we use wood handles on hammers and axes is because of the reverberation. When you have a hammer, something metal hitting, then you get this like hand shock, right? So you get reverberation moving up the wooden handle into your hand or moving up the, any handle into your hand. So wood dissipates that shock. So when you hit something, the wood can flex. So it flexes and then it dissipates that shock. Once you put metal on metal, there's no dissipation of that shock, that hand shock. So you hit something and you're gonna feel all that, that reverberation of that shock in your hand. Apparently the person who was using this didn't care about that. So maybe maybe it was like just, maybe they were hitting wood or maybe they were hitting uh, you know, tires, who knows? You know, there's all sorts of different things that you would use a hammer for that wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily care whether you were getting a ton of hand shock or not. So that's probably what it was. They were probably doing something that it didn't matter if there was hand shock, so. But this is a great little head. I really like the shape uh, and I'd love to know about this. I don't know who this mark is from. I've tried to do some research online, but if you guys know, leave me a message, leave me a comment down below. Um, again, it's a diamond shape, Japan head, diamond shape mark and JJC. TJC, TJO, but we'd love to know more. Um, if you have a question that you thought of during this or you've always been wondering for us here on the channel or something about one of the things we make, drop us a comment down below and ask the question and we'll kind of look, look through those as well as comments and questions from other videos and we'll use those for future video questions. Uh, if you head over to patreon.com forward slash the art of craftsmanship and become a patron there, you can absolutely ask a question and we will definitely answer them on future videos. Also, if you want to hear more of Devin and I talking on a regular basis, you can listen to the Art of Craftsmanship podcast, which comes out every Friday. But for now, thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video.